we will have the dictation in a little while, in a brief span of time. In the meantime, I want all of you, regardless of what your spiritual development is, regardless of for what purpose you may have come here to this place, to understand clearly that you are in effect, and when I say you, I do not refer to the human ego or the self in little letters, S-E-L-F, but I refer to the greater self, the divine self, the part of you that is the spark that did not begin less than 100 years ago to manifest in your present physical body, but the part of you that existed throughout eternity, the part of you that is divine, and the part of you that is familiar with the Father. Jesus said, I say unto you, their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. We all then should understand that all of these little ones, whether they be small of stature because they are but babes physically or whether or not they are tall of stature, are all in immediate contact through that electric spark of cosmic identity within themselves with the presence of the living God. Moses in the Sinai desert, when he witnessed the great pillar of living flame that appeared in the burning bush, asked who was speaking and was told, I am that I am. We all should understand then that this is the I am of which we speak the Om Tat Sat, I am that I am, the real part of our soul, the fabric that did not begin to be, but that always was. We have heard of the scene of a person sitting in a railroad car that comes, first of all, to a woman that is tending her sheep in the fields, and then to a house, and then at last to a mountain. And we realize that in the train, if we are to think of the woman tending her sheep as the past, and we are to think of the scene of the mountain as the future, and the man as the present, we realize that because of the ongoingness of life, the sands of time, that we think of past, present, and future. But if we are on top of the train, we see them all at once by simply sweeping our eyes through the panorama of past, present, and future. There is no past, present, or future in the eyes of soul, but only the eternal now. And that now is with us. Yes, it is possible for us to close our spiritual eyes. We can reduce our spiritual senses to rubble. We can cast down the great prize given to us into the dust. We can let our flame go out. We can be nothing. Because in reality man is as the grass of the field. But, just as we can be nothing, so we can be something because we are something. And that something is the nook pa nook of the ancient Egyptian tongue or the I am that I am. It is all of that and a great deal more. We are the potential creativity not only of this age but of the ages to come. We were born in the spiritual evolutionary process as an idea in the consciousness of God of vesting his creation, his spirit sparks with his own identity. He wanted man to be able, just as he was created in the image of God, he wanted him to attain the fullness of that 
through the element of free will. That is why free will was given to us in the first place, was so that we could exercise it correctly. Naturally, in every kind of a game, we find that a man can lose as well as win. And just as some people like to sing, born to lose, so today millions of people live their lives in that manner, born to lose. But that's not the way man was born in the idea of God. Man was born to be a winner. And he was born to win little victories in his present life that would eventually pyramid up until they were the measure of the fullness of Christ's attainment. Today we live in a very strange situation involving Christianity. People are more interested in glorifying Jesus, as though he were a pacifier, as though he were something to more or less palliate their feelings. They could say, oh Jesus, you paid it all. And they could therefore escape the exercise of their own creative energy, of their own life's energy. Nothing could be more of a slap in the face of God than for a man to think or suppose that the living God actually was appeased by the death, the shedding of blood of anyone. God is not appeased. He's not a God of wrath in reality. The thunderings of the law should be understood as a part of the nature of God. But God is law and God is love. Just as God is love, so he is law. And the law naturally thunders. Those that do well receive in return the gentle manifestation of the realities of God, joy and peace and love. But those that do ill reap because of the soul nature, the electric spark that is within themselves, the punishment that they themselves deem worthy of giving to themselves. This is a strange thing. Man wants to worship Jesus and debase his principle. He said, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. They have forgotten these words. They do not understand that be it the humblest and the lowliest person in the world in the eyes or vision of mankind, that person is a son of the living God and should be esteemed equally to the highest. We ought not to so debase ourselves as to think in terms of littleness and greatness. Greatness is within ourselves. Everyone has it because it comes from God. If we deny ourselves this, we deny God before men. If we deny ourselves this, we deny the Christ before men because we do not deem ourselves worthy. Naturally, the outer self, the flesh, the changing personality with its many faces is not necessarily entitled to anything because it is chaff, it is as grass, it fades away and perishes, it does not endure. But the soul deserves something better. Someone asked me one day, they said, well, what is the value of karma? Why does God return to man punishment? I said, God does not return punishment to man. What God is returning is instruction in the law. What you call punishment is instruction. It is brought to you because you did not do well. And they said, well, if I do evil in one life and I come back in another life and then I'm a cripple because of it and I don't know it, what good does it do me? I said to them, the soul always knows. And this is true. The soul is that electric spark. The soul knows exactly what you have done in the past and probably even knows what you will do in the future. But, if people really knew in their hearts what was right and were certain of it, I am persuaded that probably out of three and a half billion people, three billion people would probably, and more, would probably choose the right way. It is basically ignorance of cosmic law. And why is it so confused? Because men have made merchandise out of it. And this is easily understood. After all, isn't it a strange thing? Somebody is engaged in in God's business. 
the business of religion. And they go out and they do God's work among men. And then you have newspapers and you have, perhaps shall we say, motels and, and uh, automobile dealers and businessmen all over the country pointing their finger at the religious activity and saying, why, they're just in it in order to make money. When in reality, this is not true at all. Well, what are the businessmen in business for? Except to make money. All of them, they're in business to make money. And yet, the newspapers sometimes will report that this or that person is a kook because they are engaged in religious work. Those who understand the law realize that there may be many kooks in the world. I don't doubt it. But at the same time, God is not a kook. And the true business of God that is not hypocritical, honest, unabashed truth, this is permissible and is necessary. And do you know why the dark forces try to circulate that error about a lot of religions today? It's because they want to make the people think that so they can do away with the religion. And this is perfectly ridiculous because while we may not need a deeply organized religion, we do need and need it badly a real contact with the living God. I don't care whether you come out of the Sinai Desert or whether you come from the mountaintops or you come from a boat out on the sea. I don't care where you come from. You belong to the Father and the Father belongs to you. I do not like to see any man debase the greatest treasure that will ever come close to him. Well, someone will say, well, I'm not really debasing God. I just don't understand. Well, that's why we're here. That is why the hierarchy are here. That is why the great white brotherhood in the first place was created to band together spiritually this band of cosmic workers cannot be identified by people. Let's take this whole group here in all the room. Put them all out on the street and scatter them through Santa Barbara. How many people, unless you wear some distinguishing necktie or dress, how many people can pick you out as being a part of this activity or a part of any activity? Do you see what I mean? People cannot tell on the outside what you really are. Only you and God can really tell what you are. But in the eyes of God, you are made in His image. And He looks at the whole world. And He realizes they're all in His image. But they don't understand that. And they don't act as if they understood it because they don't understand it. Now it's up to us to recognize that the Great White Brotherhood in reality is trying to create awareness of the true cosmic laws. And what does it have to wade through? It's got to wade through all of the misinformation that people have about the kingdom of God. Well, here you're going to learn about masters. And these masters are real and they're alive. And they're alive forevermore. The masters will never cease to be. Well, you don't have to either. Because you see... When Jesus Christ said that a man could lose his soul or be a castaway, somehow or other in discarding ordinary orthodox religion, some people have mistakenly discarded the idea that they can be a castaway. Let me tonight explain that. There is, whether people believe this or not, and I know this to be true, the condition of the second death. The second death is different than the first death. The first death that comes to man is where the body died. No man needs to fear that in reality. All of you have died many, many times. Again and again you've died and you've been reborn. You've had to learn to eat and to walk and to talk different languages and to be different people. And the same identity has always been yours. But the name changed. Well, isn't this interesting? People have this parade of life and it's all a part of the soul. Why does God break it in the first place? Well, he breaks it in order to break our bad habits. Do you know that there's a lot of people today that get in a rut? And what's the difference between a rut and a grave? Only one of death. But people get in a rut and they keep doing the same things over and over and they never break those habits. Well, we're going to try to show you in this conference how you can overcome 
bad habits and how you can create good ones. And I want to continue about this talk about first death. So people die and they're reborn. That's not so bad. But what is the second death? It's the death of soul. Not the soul itself. The soul doesn't die exactly. It's the separation of the part of a man that is divine, which was given to him originally as his divine image, perfect and pure and beautiful, from all identity whatsoever. So man never is anymore because he doesn't do anything with his life. And that goes back to God and it doesn't re-embody with his karma. It is actually an act of mercy. In other words, people have a tremendously uh, heavy karma. Oh, it's very, very heavy. Can you imagine the karma of Adolf Hitler, for example? Or of some of the great dictators, you know, where they have actually been responsible for killing and maiming and tyrannizing millions of people. Just imagine the terrific karma some of them have piled up. Well, in some cases, and I'm not judging and saying that all dictators go through the second death. Sometimes little old ladies that wear tennis shoes may go through it, simply because they're so apathetic. This can happen. A person can be so timid and so apathetic that after a while the cosmic lords say, well, they'll never make it. And so they put them through the second death. It's an act of mercy. Why is it an act of mercy? Because when the soul goes out of the body, it would normally come back again, but it wouldn't know who it was outwardly. So what difference does it really make in one way? All that happens is that God claims the part of that person and reissues it. It amounts to the same idea as a potter sitting before a wheel, the wheel's whirling around. He takes his clay, he puts it into the perfect form, and then he looks and he says, oh, just like my little son, you know, he made a couple of bad notes. So he says, well, this isn't quite the shape I wanted it. So he just mashes it together again, starts all over again. That's what the second death really is. That's what it amounts to. It has to be done through the unfed flame. And the people are passed into the unfed flame where there is this naturally occurring separation. Now, if God were to call people tonight right back to him, before they were perfect, the same thing would happen. I want you to understand this because it is an important law. If God said, I'm the holy magnet, all of you come back to me tonight, and you started going right into the Godhead, unless you were perfect, you would be passing through the second death. So it is the great mercy of God that allows people to keep re-embodying, more or less in the child state. I say child state because man has not grown up, he has not matured, he's matured physically without maturing spiritually. So God says, go back and try it over again. Take the grade over. They come back here and they take the grade over. So you see, we have a multiplicity of experiences, don't we? And all of these experiences come to us so we can learn to do well. We have to learn to do well. Otherwise, we cannot become one with God. You see, when Christ was born, the angels sang, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill to men. Well, that's the whole idea. Glory to God in the highest. But people don't understand what God is. The scriptures record God is a spirit. So in effect, we're all spirits. But somehow or other, we seem to think of, of a spirit as being very dead. Well, that isn't true at all. We're the ones that are dead and the spirit is the animating principle of our life. Isn't that an interesting factor? But it happens to be completely true. Have you ever seen a human being laying there without a spirit? They're laid out. So we better understand that. We are spirits and we live in body temples of clay. And as far as a second death, what really happens is the battery is not only run down, we run it down until we can't recharge it anymore. And when you can't recharge it anymore because we burned up all of our soul substance and all the things of value, all of our musical appreciation, all of our appreciation of finer things, all of our appreciation of this great opportunity to inhabit God's universe, when we've just destroyed it all with a mishmash of human events and a nightmare of confusion. Why? The greatest thing in the world then is to pass them through the second death. We've seen them, both Elizabeth and I, standing before the tribunal to take the second death and with their last gasp they've swore at the karmic lords 
and went swearing into the second death. Still rebellious. And this is understandable. Do you know when Jesus Christ hung on the cross 2,000 years ago, that Jesus Christ, when he gave up the ghost, he naturally didn't actually die spiritually. He simply died physically on the cross. No matter what anybody tells you, he did. And his spirit went into the prison houses, that is into the astral plane, where the souls of the people that were embodied on this planet during the sinking of Atlantis were imprisoned there because they were the people who brought Atlantis down. Well, what happened then? Jesus went in there as a beautiful electric spirit of light. He raised his hand up. He was glistening white. And he preached to those people. And they couldn't do anything about him because he was in spiritual form. They couldn't even get near him. He had a circle of fire around him and they had a look at him because he emitted so much light that the light was just pouring out. The radiance was just flooding those people. But what did they do? They smarted and they burned and they howled and they tried to shut him up and they behaved quite a bit like they do sometimes towards Spiro Agnew. Well, isn't that an awful thing? And Spiro doesn't come anywhere near being like Jesus Christ. But the point is, that's what they did. They were rebellious to the nth degree. And Jesus went right on and he preached to them. And as I understand it, he only brought what amounted to a wave offering of maybe a sheave of maybe two or three of them all that ever paid any attention to him. They wouldn't listen to him. And now, 2,000 years later, a lot of them are reborn on this planet. At last, they've been held in that prison house for 2,000 years and were not allowed to have a body. Some of them are embodied now as hell's angels right here in California. And I'm not joking. Well, these men will probably be candidates for the second death. In their next embodiment, if they fail their opportunity in mingling with humanity today to render some cosmic service, you don't run around today and try to impose chains on humanity and consider that you're doing the right thing. Now, God doesn't hate them. Christ doesn't hate them. I don't hate them. I don't think you do. I understand this. One day, there was a mother that held that babe in her arms and said, hopefully, this is my son. This is my daughter. And that mother was looking to the day when that son or daughter would distinguish in some way her life so that she could feel that she had worthily lived in bringing them forth into the world. The wonderful opportunity of motherhood and fatherhood, do you see? Of being a parent. You know, being a parent is spelled A-P-A-R-A-N-T. But sometimes it isn't very apparent. You know what I mean? You just don't know what you have when you start out. So while monsters may sometimes dwell within ourselves, uh, the mark of the beast being stamped in human nature, we should understand and realize that the manifestation of the divine image is also very much a part of that electric spark of the cosmic reality of life that is inside of ourselves. And because it is there, we have hope and a lantern to light the night, a lantern of cosmic grace that belongs to you, that belongs to me. It is ours because God gave it to us. And the opportunity of the present time is ours because there is a world hungering and waiting for the sunrise. There is a world that needs the cosmic law. And the cosmic law need never to be trampled upon because it's so beautiful and understood. It transcends time and space. It allows man to walk through walls, to walk upon the water, to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to open blind eyes, and above all, to generate the stuff of which happiness is made in his life, not to be a victim of delusion, not to be a victim of illusion. We are here for a reason, to understand these laws. If tonight you do not understand all that I have said, put it on the shelf, as I have told one young man today, because as you wait and proceed, Throughout this conference, great light will be shed upon your path. If you yourself are hungry and thirsting after righteousness, then you shall be filled. The quest is up to you, not up to me. I do not have to stand here to convince you. You need, by divine law, to be educated in the cosmic teachings. All we can do is bring you the cosmic law. You need to appropriate it. It's your need. And when you fulfill it, you're going to find out that life can be beautiful and is because God is in you. And while he's in you, 
you are also in him. Where else can we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. To whom can we turn? He's the living word. And the living word by whom all things were made. And nothing, that's what the scripture says, nothing was made that was not made by him. Now then, how do you account for all the mistakes that are made in the world? Do you see your own role as a creator also? Do you realize that you, having free will, and getting back to that, have the power to create? Do you realize that in effect you're a god? Well, if a man is, is a god, and he's creating divinely, then he really is a god. But if he's not, you see, the difference is a borderline that's very narrow. The difference between demon and mon, or man. Divine man and demon. In other words, a demon. Someone that is moved or motivated by his own whims. You know what whimsy is? Whimsy is purposeless drift. Now we're talking about a man looking at the fruit of life. You gaze upon a beautiful red apple hanging on a tree and you realize that in that apple is the delicious juice that nature put there and your teeth are waiting to go into that apple, do you see? I'm not talking about the apple in the middle of the Garden of Eden, but I'm talking about any apple, a beautiful red apple, if there it hangs and you can see the dew upon it, you can taste it and it's radiant with delight, the fruit of the earth. Well, just as there is a purpose in that apple, the purpose being eating, so there is a purpose in all doing in this world. There's a purpose. And if what you're doing is not purposeful, if it is harmful to your fellow men, if it is harmful to your society, if it is harmful to your world, then better you should rid yourself of it and improve your life and the quality of your life to the point where we can make something Make a golden age out of this world. That is beauty. It is the beauty of creating an age. After all, everybody in the world can look at you, but you can't look at yourself. You never will be able to. Why? Because you can't take your eyes very easily out of your head and turn them around and look at yourself. So physically speaking, the only way you can see yourself is in a mirror. And people are reflections of what they think of you. And these opinions may be very erroneous. So don't worry about human opinions. But listen, worry about divine opinions if you're going to worry at all. God has a very good opinion of you. Did you know that? If you will allow the divine opinion of you to come to fruition like that red apple hanging from a tree, why the most magnificent creature is going to emerge out of the cocoon of human ignorance that is built around man and you're going to suddenly find that with all you're getting you have gotten understanding at last. And that's a beautiful moment. And it's a moment that doesn't have to stop because the minute you think you've got it all, there's something else right around the corner. And that's exactly true. In this creative universe, God has really fixed it so we don't have to be bored if we keep alert. If we allow our senses to go to sleep and say, oh, well, let's have some fun. What do you call fun? It just passes, you see. No matter what you do, it passes and it's gone. But the kingdom of heaven is a kingdom of magnificent delights. There are inward delights that most of you have no idea of. I know I didn't, and I know that I'm such a beginner, such a novice. And I sometimes say to myself, well, when are you going to get wise? Because I realize that the masters have such a greater depth of knowledge than we do here in this world of time. But I know that there's hope for you because I feel there's hope for me. There's hope for us all. And the hope is in Christ. And Christ means light. And he says, I am the light of the world. That means that the true I am is the light of the world. You just be that and understand that purpose. Keep yourselves open. Realize that dogma doesn't save anybody except the dogs. And I'm not sure that they're saved either. I think they have an awful short chain. And the chain is probably fastened to an awful short clothesline. So please understand that we're not about the business of feeding people dog food and things like that. What we're concerned with is giving you spiritual food so that you can grow. Throughout this conference you're going to find this. And you're going to find that the growth will take place entirely because you want it to. Not because I want it to, God knows I do. 
Not because God wants it to. God knows that he wants it to happen too. But because you want it to happen. That's where the alchemy takes place. God bless you.